a grand synthesis. I'm going to leave these two tomorrow morning when I come to the time. When you're, when you're feeling better refreshed. But I'm going to go quickly as a context setting for the coming guest lecture by the next generation to um, quickly cover three important exemplar sources of health big data. Um, and uh, the first one with which I will start is going to be one that focuses on uh, on, on data that's drawn from from a uh, uh, type of, of uh, routine behavior um, that uh, many of you have uh, frequently engaged in, to wit, uh, be behavior associated with searching uh, online. Um, this is not something that is often considered health behavior, but a remarkable amount of searches are in fact health related. I won't say majority by any means. But just as with tweets, approximately 3% we found to be health related. If we look at tweets versus stats one as a whole, when we look at the subset of those that are health related, it's about 3%. Um, so it is that a very important subset of search data is is health uh, is health related. Um, uh, we're going to be talking and going successively in a um, uh, towards the right here. Um, this sort of um, type of behavior or this sort of uh, type of data offers coarser insights. Uh, as it turns out, we can't tell if it's one person searching a hundred times or a hundred people searching once each. Um, there's no real recruitment involved. Um, uh, but we have uh, difficulties understanding the narrative context for those tweets, or and we can't follow individually uh, people individually at a longitudinal level. Um, our interest here in all three data sources is going to be high velocity data, data that gives us a peek as to dynamics, the behavior over time, because of the central role that dynamics plays in dynamic models um, as a way of comparing models with this data or as a way of feeding this data into models as exogenous factors. Dynamics within the observed data often clue us into dynamics in the world uh, that can ground our model as well. So from a combined data and system science lens, we're interested in this behavior over time. Um, and uh, this includes growth in, in, say, searching on certain topics and waning of interest in response to certain events and, uh, and trends. Okay? Um, that sort of data will be readily available on all three of these um, approaches, as we'll see. So let's talk about search behavior. So volumes of search queries. So when I talk about volumes, I mean the, the uh, numbers or the relative count of search queries being executed on a regular basis, up from three, every three hours, which is about the finest resolution we've been able to find with Google, and to every day, to every week or month, um, or every year. Um, these sort of time series can provide some indication of interest within a certain geographical region, and interest on, uh, within a certain topic or a certain, a certain search query. They depict the aggregate results. They don't alert to individual behavior. Uh, it's fairly coarse-grained resolution. It's just the search expression or the search topic. For example, if you're searching for, hyper, for hypertension, regardless of whether you search hypertension or high blood pressure, um, it, will, it can group them into a topic, as we'll see. And Google knows enough to kind of group things that are, are topical in, in many cases. Um, and uh, as we'll see, uh, with Google Trend Search, we can do comparison between uh, different search queries. We can uh, examine geographic disaggregation based on tweet volume. And we can, um, through the scope of our query, we can determine the level of time granularity. Uh, for example, whether we get daily data or whether we get weekly data. So an example here is for Lyme disease. So these are searches for Lyme disease from Massachusetts. 
uh, over the past five years. And um, uh, a few things will stand out immediately, of course. Um, uh, one thing is that you can't see it here clearly, but this is scaled on 0 to 100. Okay? Um, and indeed, all of Google's search query information, uh, volume information, is scaled 0 to 100. And it's scaled for the region of time indicated or queried. So this 100 is, by definition, the maximum amount within the time. Okay? Uh, I don't think there's always a zero uh, in here. You'll notice also that there's regularities associated with it. Uh, these regularities you might surmise to be seasonal, and you would do so with reason. Um, these are seasonal. These peak in the summer, um, and maybe maybe in, in fall as well. Um, uh, this sort of search data is for a particular geography, um, and it's something which um, you can note uh, trends over time. So, for example, for whatever reason, 2016 exhibited smaller variation. This is tick bite together with, with Lyme disease. And, and if you examine these uh, jointly, um, it'll become obvious that they're not independently scaled from within that range up to 100. Rather, um, one of them, uh, the, the entire uh, combination is. And you'll notice that there's some plausible correlation between them. And there's an association between them. Let's note, um, when one tends to be high, so does the other. You'll also notice that even some particular features associated with it, such, such as this kind of um, later fall bump uh, seem to suggest um, uh, seems to suggest a um, concern, perhaps extending for uh, associated with Lyme disease and tick bite jointly. I would note, uh, being a Boston boy myself, that um, that uh, Lyme disease is uh, prevalent within uh, Massachusetts. It is uh, Massachusetts, um, uh, like Saskatchewan, exhibits a measure of seasonality to its weather. Um, we have this thing called snow um, that some of you may be less familiar with. Um, and um, yeah, more of it in Boston. Um, and uh, even more in Worcester. Um, but the point here is that uh, ticks uh, tend to, uh, tend to uh, be in, in particular quantities searching for a host and, and particularly prone to biting in the fall. And so that may be why you see that. That, um, that spike there. But you'll notice there is this uh, association between the two, which suggests some sort of concerns perhaps obtaining between Lyme disease and tick bites uh, in common. If we look at Lyme disease and a rash, um, so here uh, are rashes, and here are concerns about uh, Lyme disease. Um, once again, it it turns out that an early symptom of Lyme disease is a bullseye rash. I don't know if you folks are familiar with it, but it's making its way into Canada. And one of the characteristic patterns is, is, is of a rash with a bullseye type pattern, a circular pattern. Um, uh, but at the same time, there's some spurious correlations here. Correlation does not mean causation. And in fact, in two factors that are causally related, you can have correlation, you can have anti-correlation, and you can have no correlation observed over time, and over the long term, because correlation cancels with anti-correlation. But they can be causally, one can be causally driving another. Uh, this is one of the strengths of CCM, to, to ferret those things out. Yes? So you were talking about just correlation, anti-correlations, and then Correct. no correlation. And no correlation. You can find periods of time over which there's no apparent correlation because there's periods of correlation, periods of, no, of anti-correlation, and overall there's no, the correlation coefficient, say the Pearson correlation coefficient, is zero. Sorry, probably because my limited terminology is, what's the difference between no correlation and anti-correlation? Anti-correlation will be one is up, the other, when one goes up, the other tends to go down. Oh, negative correlation. So like negative? Negative correlation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so this is between sunburn and Lyme disease. Two 
seasonal factors, but factors that are unlikely to be to have a, a same fundamental causal mechanism driving the searches. So one has to be careful. These are associational data. Um, uh, here's, here's some longer term trends, symptoms of food poisoning. I have no idea what's, what's driving this trend. Um, I don't believe it's the uh, current administration, the US's hamstringing of public health or of the uh, infrastructure to guard against um, uh, foodborne illness. Uh, this is West Nile virus uh, for the United States over time. You can see some pronounced patterns associated with, uh, with certain years um, and not others. These were early years associated with West Nile when it first spread in through the Bronx Zoo, an infected animal from Africa um, uh, ended up uh, getting bitten by mosquitoes and ended up getting spread. Um, uh, and this is uh, interest over time. Here's Zika mentioned. So this is Zika. And Zika versus uh, Zika searches versus news mentions for Zika. So you can sense them both on Google Trends because you can ask it to show me news mentions. So this is news, uh, blue, and these are Zika searches in um, orange. Um, and uh, what you'll see is a fair degree of correlation between, uh, uh, particularly early on, uh, less so later, although um, some significant um, uh, peaks are, seem to be aligned. Um, uh, so um, West Nile virus I had mentioned. Um, if you look at uh, West Nile virus, you can actually uh, map out, excuse me, um, uh, where this is occurring over time, and I, I, I seem to have misplaced the, the map component, but you can find some correlation to what incidence relates to. Um, uh, and uh, very interesting, with a tool called Google Correlate, which is a very interesting tool, you can go from a search, say Zika virus, and find other things that are highly correlated with that in terms of search behavior. So for example, for Zika virus, it suggests Zika spelled with a Z-I-C-A. Translation, Z-I-C-A for our American guests. Um, or Ziki, or Zika, or Zinka, or, or Zika. And the point is that people are searching for a wide variety of terms, trying to grapple with you know spelling this thing correctly, but very likely these are misplaced searches that are seeking out similar information, but um, just don't 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 know how to to spell it. You know, seek up, right? Um, uh, quite interesting, quite insightful in my in my experience. Um, uh, okay, um, right. Um, I could, I could go on with this. Uh, this is related to measles and MMR vaccination uh, searches um, uh, and for different, uh, different areas. This is a, a very interesting one. Um, I do a lot of teaching historically in Australia. And many of the students who are here um, uh, have been to Australia. Wade, uh, an internship. Um, uh, Alex, uh, who's, who's stepped out. Um, uh, um, and, and young um, to, to mention some of them. Um, if you look at searches for whooping cough in Australia, otherwise known as pertussis, um, a, a prevalent childhood infection, what one will see is this time series. Is there any point in that time series that strikes you as interesting from the standpoint of, of curious change? When is it? Yeah, it's about March, it's about the week of March 20th. And if you turn and you look at the news in Australia at that time, this was the week in which a tragic case of Baby Riley occurred. Baby Riley was an infant who tragically died of pertussis in a very publicized case. Baby Riley, ladies and gentlemen, was not vaccinated. And you'll notice that it seems to have kicked off 
for a period of more than a year, a very material change in, shall we say, interest related to pertussis. Now, what that means in terms of ideation is not fully, fully explicated. But it's pause in terms of, of our thinking about the situation, how long these effects last, what it might mean. In short, can play a role in some sort of theory building as to how, how prominent cases affect ideation or thinking or, or uh, search, uh, health information search behavior over time. This is empirical data for search related to H1N1 and through various keywords in Quebec during the, um, the second peak, the deuxième vague of the, um, the flu pandemic of 2009-2010. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a more recent facet of, of great significance which is Canadian searches for naloxone. Anyone know what naloxone is? Opioid antagonist um, administered um, to help prevent death from, opi uh, from opioid overdoses or, or risk of death, or risk of death. And what one finds is, you know, uh, an almost exponential growth in later periods across Canada, with certain regions being prominent, BC, particularly hard hit by the opioid epidemic, the Maritimes in Ontario um, uh, being prominently associated with it. So what are the, so a lot of patterns there. Patterns over time are of great significance, I've argued, in the context of this boot camp. Dynamic patterns relate to dynamics in our models. Patterns like this can be used to ground our models, inform our models, understand patterns that our models might try to explain or might try to match. What are some strengths of this? Well, there's a very high frequency of searching worldwide. When I put this down, I said uh, it was greater than 60,000 searches per second on Google worldwide. I think it's only gone up from there. Um, there's broad use throughout society and across different languages and uh, I believe socioeconomic groups. It's fairly high temporal resolution. You can get it for short periods of time. If you've queried short periods of time, you can get it every three hours for many jurisdictions. This sort of search volume data. Um, imagine that for an out, uh, for a for a um, incipient outbreak, or concerns about bad air quality, for example, or concerns uh, regarding you know a messaging campaign. Um, uh, from from either adverse actors like tobacco companies or, or public health actors. Um, it, it has very broad use for health information seeking. A lot of people search out health information online. It's a major use of the internet. Um, and together with other media, you can get some recognition of, of elements of message retention. You know, if you know what messages are being put out by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or by Public Health Agency of Canada or provincial advisories, you may be able to connect a, a particular advisory with searching behavior related to, say, West Nile virus or, or mosquito personal protective behavior or, or what have you. Um, and you can do ready comparison with, with other searches. Um, and I've noted um, you can compare to news stories, incidents, message campaigns, uh, product introduction, etc. There's some weaknesses of, of search trend data. Uh, it provides some indication of interest over time in a defined spatial region, but you know, um, I say medium to low temporal resolution. I, I would say actually it's, it's at least medium. I, I'm not sure um, why I said that. This may have been earlier. What it does require is artful harvesting of the data in overlapping windows. You can get at least um, uh, at least daily resolution. The reason I say artful is because if you ask for, say, search data for the past 10 years, you will get it at, I think, monthly resolution. You want to get daily? Well, you could search the past month and you'll get daily. You say, oh man, so now I'm handicapped over long periods of time. No. You just search for overlapping windows and you anchor one window off the other one. Each one is scaled from zero to, from, to 100, and, and you can basically harvest it and reason about their relative values and figure out weekly, uh, daily data for the past 10 years. 
You just have to do it in a careful way with shifting windows. We have code to do that if anyone's interested. Uh, to piece together a complete time series at fine resolution from, um, for many particular time windows searched um, at higher resolution. It's difficult to interpret um, um, in, in many cases. Um, why are people searching for measles? Is it because they want to get vaccinated? Is it because you know, they're, they're concerned whether, uh, you know, what the symptoms are, um, they're concerned they may have it, it's not clear. User subgroups are unclear, um, other than geographic areas. Uh, there's many observe, unobserved confounders associated with it. Frequently it is coarse geographic resolution. Here in Saskatchewan, our population is not the largest. And we have North and South Saskatchewan as zones. Um, in the U.S., many metropolitan areas will have, um, you know, Cincinnati City as as one geographic area, and other counties perhaps around it sometimes carved out as other geographic areas, sets of counties. There's little sense of distinct users, no sense of longitudinal progression of the user that the users first search for Zika spelled this way and then again and, and another way, and it's by no means a, a representative sample. Um, Search trend data does give us some clue of awareness and sometimes perhaps concern or, um, or interest in a given topic. Um, trying to ferret out its deeper meaning is hard to do just in this environment. But if we can look at someone whose behavior is recorded as a smartphone at the same time as their searching behavior is recorded, using browser-based monitoring, we may be able to better understand what some of these behaviors mean. But search data is an extremely easy, free, um, uh, easily accessible, fairly high resolution, um, geographically situated type of big data for health. It is, however, on the coarser side here. There's no recruitment required. Um, but it, it forms a valuable part of the, the uh, data collection um, in the big, health, uh, big data for health area. So I'm going to stop that, but I'd be glad to answer any questions about it before I go on to self-published data in the form of tweets. Any questions about search data?